enough about my disappointment in one of my favorite games from last year. Let's talk about Am- I'm sorry, not Amazon. I don't know why Amazon was on the mind. I know why though. Activision <laughs> Blizzard. They are converting all US QA staff to full time and they raise their minimum wage. This is something that seems like there's a wave in terms of politically. Um, we're seeing a lot more, um, you know, stuff of this nature. And so obviously yeah. it's going to hit the video game industry as well. Yeah. So what are your initial thoughts on this? I mean, I obviously have a very positive view on this, but what is your view on this? I, well, I don't, I don't necessarily think there's a negative on the face of it. Uh, we can get in more into the nitty gritty in a bit, but this is awesome. I mean, I think they said 1100 workers were Mm -hmm. um, impacted by this, which I don't know if that means that 1100 were converted to full-time or some of those were converted to full-time and others got a pay bump that were already full-time. Not sure what the case is there, Um, but that's awesome. I mean, that's a big, that's a big change. And it also, I, I I forget which one of the articles that was commenting on this said something to the effect of like, this isn't just a response to the unionization pressure, which is happening at Raven. It also makes sense from a business perspective because suddenly Call of Duty, I mean, not suddenly, it's it's been this way for the past couple of years, but now there's this, there's a stable state of Call of Duty as a live service yep. and not a yearly release, chiefly anymore, which mm-hmm. means that you need, you don't need QA staff the same way in a seasonal dynamic that you would have with a, with yearly releases, Mm -hmm. you need, you need them full time because you've got a, you've got, you know, a a beast that you have to feed in that live service. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's great. It's, it's awesome for the QA staff. It's, um, I think it's (laughs) a good move generally, but there is, um, you know, there's this union union question, which, uh, yeah, Alfredo. Yeah, I, I was gonna say the same thing. Yeah, pay people more. I I love it when I get raises, so everyone should have raises, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I I think it's um we're seeing this especially with games that do particularly well. Instead of you know these companies giving their CEO uh you know X amount of oh here half not five million dollars because your well, game did, did that. so well. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure they do that, but they they're also that. passing it down. And we're seeing that with um, Bandai Namco also did something very similar, which published Elden Ring. Um, and they gave all of their workers like 50,000 yen, like pay, pay salary increase, which I don't know what that translates to in US dollars, but definitely not $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fifty thousand dollars. I don't know what it is, but it's still like uh, pretty impressive across everyone. But they have all of that money from Elden Ring, so they can, you know, afford to reward people from their work, which is awesome. As opposed to, you know, it, it's just very good news in comparison to all of the horrible stuff that uh, we previously heard about Activision Blizzard in particular. So it's nice to see that they're, you know, actually valuing their workers and, you know, giving them uh, some additional benefits and money. Yeah. And um, also just to follow up, we reported this earlier last year because um, Raven, there was a key demand by the QA team in December. And that's when it began that two month strike. And then it yeah, ended yeah. with a unionization vote um, mm-hmm. that happened in January, late January, I believe. I don't know the results of that after that, but I know that's this is kind of like a follow up to that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, to clarify, all, all of the um, contract QA at Raven or a sizable chunk of them, at least their contracts were not renewed. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were effectively let go. Mm-hmm. And that's what prompted the. Um, initial strike and then and then call for unionization there was not an official vote to unionize as far as i know there was a preliminary vote to like garner interest in in unionizing Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure but the union stuff is still going on and the the interesting wrinkle in this is that everybody across all of activision's studios in the u.s everybody in qa was affected by this except for raven's qa which is attempted to unionize Mm -hmm. now i wish we had Cole here, who is our uh, our resident 
um, he was a law law student at one point. The Duke of the Law <laughs> has a law degree. I, I think he has a law degree, right? Yeah, has a law degree. Um, to ask him, you know, about the particulars of this, um, but Activision, when asked why Raven was not part of the pay bump, they said that they basically said that they they couldn't do that because of um because of the negotiations due to legal obligations yeah, yeah due to legal yeah. obligations under the national labor relations act basically saying legal because speak. they're unionizing we can't adjust their pay yep. because that's illegal or there's something like that so it i could not find proper channels who knows i couldn't find anything online that was like actually giving this a critical eye and and diving in into it from a, a legal perspective i gotta i gotta uh maybe search on youtube a little bit more um for some other takes on that, but all of like the games industry articles were essentially just regurgitating the Bloomberg article that sourced it. Mm -hmm. um, and the Bloomberg article, as far as I saw, did not look at that, look at that statement critically. Well, criticize the statement without looking into the legitimacy of it. So I don't know if that's like, is that bullshit or is that real? Right. Or is it real, but also kind of bullshit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, it's, it's hard to say, but, but, from their perspective, from the union's perspective, this seems like an attempt to drive away interest for the rest of Activision QA from unionizing. Right. Which, right. you know, which every very company well is, may be, and it would which be effective. Mo most companies don't want to, <laughs> they don't Have want they to deal with the union. Unions. You know, yeah. I, and just me, um, I love basketball. And so every, I'd say like six, seven years, there is a lockout. And that's when the players union and the owners basically can't agree on a collective bargaining agreement. And so that, I remember I used to be super pro union and until I see like, okay, like there, I see why this is not a positive thing for business. From the Unions just actual. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I think unions, like in some circles, unions get villainized. In some circles, unions get valorized. Unions are just a tool, right? And they have they have great benefits in certain contexts, and they have severe drawbacks in other contexts. And it's important to understand what the benefits and drawbacks are going to be. I, I don't mm -hmm. think you can just. Oftentimes, it, the you, the enthusiasm needed to start a union, typically comes from a rah rah unionize let's join hands and work together yeah. kind of mentality so um often that kind of like union propaganda uh not to smear but but that's kind of what it is sticks to it and people don't want to once you know don't want to critically look at the union that might, might be benefiting them in some way Right. Um, and then on the other coin, people a, a lot of times don't want to see the potential benefits of, of unionizing um, because of X, Y, and Z, other things that happened in other unions and, and ways in which they were they were flawed. Um, I can say personally, like I'm I'm not really sure what I would want in terms of like because this this seems to me to be the most serious potential for unionization across the games industry i mean I, th I think if the domino falls at raven it could quickly fall at qa in qa at many other studios once it falls in qa many other disciplines are going to be wrapped up in that mm -hmm. i do um, wonder what this whole activism blizzard situation situation is going to look like once the merge with microsoft happens because, you know, Microsoft, we assume Microsoft did step in and say, hey, come over to Microsoft where everything is great and we treat our employees <laughs> well. And although Halo Infinite doesn't have maps, you know, you'll get your time off. Um, so I do wonder, like, when the merge actually happens, because it does look like it's going to happen uh, and won't be blocked. I do wonder, you know, how long, what will Activision Blizzard look like? after that after like all the leadership changes after what will happen to these unions uh, will there be more what will happen to the employees in general hopefully their culture gets better but i i would just wonder you know how smooth of a transition and if that it's gonna be and what it's 
the company itself is going to look like under Microsoft's leadership, which I assume will be a lot better than what it currently is. Yeah, interestingly, I forget where I heard this, but um, Microsoft did say that they would not get in the way of this union being recognized if Activision decided to recognize them. Mm -hmm. However, that too, yep. in the actual writing of the um, the purchase agreement, I guess, of of, of uh, Activision, I forget what the exact, exact document is called, but it says that they cannot recognize a, a union. Oh. So there is like, hmm. I think it, I'm pretty sure what's in writing is it completely disagrees with what Microsoft has said. Right. Publicly. Yeah, but that's something hmm. change, right? That's not anything that's like set in stone. It's not, it's not the Bible. Hopefully. You know, it's, <laughs> I don't know. To them, to them it might be, but it's stuff can get changed depending on the situation, I would assume. Definitely seems like Microsoft is a lot more lax in those regards where they're like, where I could definitely see them going like, oh, it says that we'll just change it in an amendment or whatever. Do do you think then that gaming will ever get as far as unionization goes, ever get to the degree of let's say in like the SAG, like SAG, like the Screen Actors Guild or something of that yeah, nature. Like, like, like Hollywood, where everything is a union. Right. And even like um sports, where each sports sure. like league has there's a union that represents the players. Do you there think it is? I didn't know that. Yeah, like each like and they're very and they're super powerful too. Like they're mm. Like, I, I watch NBA lockouts and the players just like I've never seen like the union side be able to exercise so much power over the other side before. It's, it's weird in the NBA. It's only thing, like usually it's not the case, but in the NBA, that's the case. But I think this and SAG as well. SAG is a really powerful one too. Do you yep. think video games Ben will ever get to that place where that's more readily accepted or probably not? It's difficult to say. It's difficult to say. Hollywood came up in a time where unions in general were much wi more widespread in America, were much more widely accepted. It, they Hollywood came up in the midst of the biggest union period of the country. And just to expand just a little bit, it was founded in 1933, SAG. So yeah, yeah. That, that lines hmm. up what you're saying. Yep. yep. Um, but SAG is not the only one. I mean, there's the Directors Guild, there's the Writers Guild, there's there's right, uh, yeah. I forget what the what the guild is for, like you know, uh, below the line jobs like grips and I think that uh, even those have individuals sex. like uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but they're more readily accepted in the movie industry. Well, I mean, it's the it's basically the cost of doing business in, in the right. industry. You you more or less cannot make an officially sanctioned movie unless you're working with with right. with unions and i mean if you want any recognizable actor in your movie right you're working with unions um so i don't think the games industry is going to get to that point um we are in a particularly weird job world right now um coming out of covid and out of the work from home after out of a lot of people losing their jobs out of a lot of people uh, having priority shifts in their life where they realize, oh my God, I do not want, want to do the things I was doing for the money that I was doing them for. Um, and labor is like quite valuable at the moment. There's, you know, still, still shortages of, uh, of, of um, people to fill basic jobs. And that has definitely hit the games industry. Um, people are, getting crazy offers to leave otherwise great jobs for greener pastures. Um, mm -hmm. The tech industry is not, has not been immune to this and um, games, game studios are, are definitely seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of poaching, a lot of people leaving for brighter horizons, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so there is like something what i'm trying to say there is like the the conditions for a big union push in the games industry have never been better however mm. i think it takes more than that to get to hollywood levels w what i'm seeing here like i said you know if the domino falls at raven and the legitimate union gets formed there and it's recognized and we sit with that for a couple of years and we see what that means and 
QA studios at other or QA place um, QA workers at other studios start looking at Raven's QA like, oh man, maybe you know we should do the same thing. The dominoes start falling at QA departments all over the country, and then it's other disciplines from there. I, mm -hmm. I think like what once once momentum starts getting built, I think it could. I think we could see a large swaths of the games industry unionized. Um, but the likelihood, especially after this, especially after this, because the enthusiasm for something like this after you just got hired on full time and got a pay raise, it has diminished greatly across yep. across all of Activision. So I, I see the likelihood of them getting this union together as less than it was previously. If it does happen, I, I could see the dominoes falling, but I, I still feel like that, that's definitely a less than 50% chance at this point. It's probably closer to like a 10% chance. Mm. Yeah, it definitely seems the case that, you know, people always talk about unions when they're unhappy with the work conditions of the job. So because they get exactly like you said, pay raise. OK, we don't, maybe we don't need a union like you guys are treating us better because you gave us more money. And I feel like that might um, also compound when you know, the Microsoft change happens as well. You know, if they do bring those better policies in, then maybe people will start feeling, oh, we don't need a union because Microsoft treats us pretty good, way better than we were. So we're doing all right right now. So we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see. We'll, we'll keep the story going because obviously it's the continuation of a story we've done in the past. So I'm sure there's going to be updates to this as we go. Um. Shouts out to Activision Blizzard for raising the minimum wage, though. That's that's I don't see how that could ever be spun as like bad news. So if you know, hopefully <laughs> that follows suit. But besides that, let's get into our reminisce. And it's going to be me this week. Now, as y'all know, I've been playing Elden Ring. And I had a thought. I was like, I think I might be able to go back and play Bubble now. I think I can. Wait, I think what? I, can. <laughs> I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. What? The thing is, I did. I, I played up until I forgot which boss it was. But there was one boss where I was like, fuck this. I'm done. I feel like I was like maybe the fifth <laughs> bothered wow. guest going. Here, probably. I beat him. No, I beat him. Okay. Well, somebody after that. And I was like, I'm done. I put in enough time in this. I'm not enjoying. I and even to get to that point, I had probably put in like 20 hours, just in terms of how many. I really tried, and I was like, I don't know. Playing Elden Ring, I don't know why, but that gameplay just clicked way faster for me. And I was like, you know what? I kind of get these games now. Let me log back in and let me see. I breeze through. I breathe in a way that I that would have taken me like two hours. Took me like 20 minutes. Got Dang. all the way to the first boss without dying. I was like, oh my God, like I get these games now. Yeah. You're a master of them. Once you know one, you know enough yep. to get through uh, the rough part of all of them. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is about Bloodborne, obviously, but I would like to say I think Elden Ring is the best tutorial for the From Software games. Like it, to me, because it honestly is the most approachable. They do. I feel like they did their best job with. I feel like they're people are criticizing the tutorial. I'm like it's perfect because you can skip it if you want to, or you can go through it as many. Like, if you go back to the cave of knowledge in Elden Ring, you can get the tutorial again. So it's like they did a really good job of like showing you how to play initially. In the open world, you're battling a lot more than you would in Bloodborne or Dark Souls because you're just an open world. So you're getting better at the combat through that. And so I go back to Bloodborne and I'm like, okay, like this is making a lot of sense. And it honestly made me play Elden Ring a little differently because I was doing a lot of sword and um, sword and shield, basically just normal combo with a little bit of magic. And playing Bloodborne, I'm like, I understand the value of this, this gun now. I get it. Like <laughs> it, it felt like I had never shot the gun for a parry in my entire time playing Bloodborne before. Now I'm like, wait, there was a gun. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was a gun you get that you get by default. Parry and gun. you use it as opposed to your shield. You use it to kind of parry the enemy. Hmm. And Sounds cool. 
I learned that Elden Ring has a very similar weapon. That's how I, I was shocked. Because I played Bulbar, I was like, I kind of want to do this in Elden Ring now. And so apparently if you use the whip, hmm. the whip kind of hmm. acts as the gun. Because it's just it's not as quick as the gun, but it's nearly there and it and it stuns your opponent the same hmm. way. So the fact that I'm able to kind of like swap through these games just back and forth, I'm like, okay, like Elden Ring has done its job. It's it's the perfect introduction to this series. If anybody hasn't played it yet, like if you haven't played these games, you've been intimidated by these games, definitely try Elden Ring because Bloodborne to me just feels a lot better after playing it. And I think does, it's what you go ahead, Ben. Or, does I'm sorry, go ahead, does right it now. hold up is what I was going to ask. Bloodborne. I think it does because honestly, I was playing and I was like, "Yeah, it runs at thirty. It looks like it's at like nine twenty, and I, I like, it doesn't. It doesn't look like it's a full like fully HD, mm-hmm. but it looks good just based on the art style. Cool. Just don't play with the lights off because you're not gonna be able to see shit. <laughs> besides, besides that, I was I was playing. I was I played through a good two hours of it this week. I was like, I cannot believe that this game holds up in this way. I'm super impressed. I always respect it from software, but damn. The fact that I'm playing a seven-year or eight, seven or eight-year-old game at this point, and it's holding up pretty well, and that's just based on just strictly their gameplay, I have to give my kudos to Bloodborne. It, it feels like it was ahead of its time a little bit. Because I definitely feel Elden Ring in... Or I feel... I feel Bloodborne in Elden Ring a little bit in terms of how fast the character moves. Because the one thing in Dark Souls, even in Demon Souls, your character moves like a little sluggish to me. And Bloodborne, it's very fast. Really? I remember it the complete opposite where it it feels like I remember Bloodborne being a lot more me- methodical than like the Dark Souls games. But maybe it's just been so long since I played them. No, yeah, I, Dark Souls one and two and Demon Souls are much slower compl- compared to Bloodborne, and then Bloodborne significantly up the pace, and they never went slower from that. Oh wow! So yeah. I mean, Dark Souls basically maintained pace. I, Dark Souls probably split the difference between the original uh, Dark Souls and um, and Bloodborne for Dark Souls mm-hmm. three, but then Sekiro obviously got super fast, and and uh, right. I think Elden Ring is is about on at, in parity with Dark Souls three. They're just yeah. moving around all over the place. Jeez. <laughs> That's the one thing I started really appreciating about Elden Ring. I'm like, I like I'm literally playing with the whip and the sword. I'm like, I'm literally playing this like Bloodborne now. Is that the weapons you're using? A whip and a sword? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. And yeah, I just go in with the magic and everything. I'm like, okay, this is just perfect. Like, I'm, I'm yeah, like combining like Belmont. Basically, yep. basically. All right. And it's weird because I'm like, man, this game, if whatever Souls game you've played. There is a way to play this game. Like, like if you like Sekiro, it obviously it has the poise system, kind of like the system in Sekiro. Mm-hmm. But even, like, you can play as a ninja class, which is more like Sekiro, I've heard. Um, playing my way kind of makes it so it's more like Bloodborne. And then, obviously, you can play sword, sword and shield, normal. Mm-hmm. And magic is really good, too. So I'm like, yeah, like... I know this was supposed to be about Bloodborne, but it turned into some a praise about Elden Ring. But I guess this is just a reminisce on From Software in general. Um, respect to them as a developer, and I'm going to be experimenting with some of the other Souls games. So we'll see what happens for the rest of the year. Don't don't get Blood or Dark Souls uh, two withdrawal or what, I don't oh. know what to call it. Like overload. Like don't don't play too much over it because yeah, then by the time Game of the Year comes back, you're going to be like. Oh, these games suck. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not thing. going to play the whole series this year. I plan on getting through Bloodborne finally, and then I'm going to probably play Dark Souls 3. And then obviously you have to play the blessed one, which is Sekiro. Demon Souls. Oh, no. Sekiro. Oh, Sekiro. Okay. You know, sure. I might play Demon Souls. <laughs> I'm halfway through Demon Souls, so I might just go ahead and complete that. If anybody wants to co op with me, just let me know because I, I might just do that. But, um,. Sekiro now. I I, pro, I tried to play that. So good. I own it, tried it, and I was like, I do. I to me, I don't like pairing like that. It's so good. It's so I don't fun. like pairing like I, I don't like games where I have to parry a lot. I just don't like the feeling. And that Perfect. game is all parry. Yep, I love it. 
it's like so a much. rhythm it's like a rhythm game i was like i don't know i don't know if i <laughs> maybe maybe that would be the last souls game i play mm. that'll be yeah the close, close it out with the best one we'll, we'll see we'll, we'll see when i get there <laughs> but i want to thank everybody for listening or watching the dukes of gaming podcast again you can listen to us on your favorite podcast service watch us on youtube watch us on twitch leave a like a review a comment anything to help support the show you can even email us at the real dukes of gaming at gmail.com to have your question read live on air we'll be coming at you next week with some more hot takes hit the bell as well to get notifications on when we release our latest videos on youtube we post everywhere every week so make sure you start your week right the Dukes of Gaming. And with that being said,
Hey you, you look like you're in need of a vacation. A Friday Island vacation where you get to hear about the things you enjoy. Here we talk about everyone's favorite movies, TV shows, video games, and more. We keep things pretty laid back here, but we also do our research. We've got trivia, questions about plot holes, some hilariously bad reviews, and more. New episodes go up every Friday, obviously. So come on and join Neil and I over on Friday Island Podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll see you there.